Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3 in our course, MEC Engineering Statics. My name is Jay Mendelson. I'm a lecturer in the Mechanical Engineering Department. This week, we're going to review Chapter 3 on Rigid Bodies and Equivalent Systems of Forces. So you'll be reading Chapter 3 in our book, Vector Mechanics for Engineers. And we have two homework assignments for you, numbers three and four, that you'll do on the Connect website. External forces are exerted by other objects on a rigid body, and they cause that object to translate, rotate, or ensure that it remains at rest. In figure 3.1a in the lower left, we see a picture of three guys pulling a broken truck. And in figure 3.1b, we see the free body diagram. There's the force F acting to the right on the front of the truck that represents the three guys pulling on a rope. There is the weight W of the truck, which is located at the center of gravity of the truck. And there's two forces, R1 and R2, which are the reactions from the ground on the front and rear wheels. Internal forces, on the other hand, hold together the particles that make up the rigid body. And if that rigid body has several parts, the forces holding the parts together are internal forces. We're going to discuss internal forces in full when we get to chapter 7. Two forces, F and F prime, are called equivalent forces when they have the same effect on a rigid body. And the action of a force may be transmitted along its line of action, as we discussed at the beginning of chapter two. So on the left, we show the weight of the truck, W acting down, our reactions on the wheels, R1 and R2, and we show force F from one guy pulling on a rope at the front of the truck. And that's an equivalent force to having four guys or more push on the back of the truck, because F and F prime are acting along the same line of action, which I'll show you here with my mouse. This line of action of F is the same line of action at F prime. It's the same distance from the truck to the ground. So you could prove it by just measuring the distance from the bottom of the tire to where the force is applied. And those forces, F and F prime, are called equivalent forces. And here's some real people trying this out. The guy on the left is all by himself pulling on a fire truck, and the four guys are on the right pushing their pickup truck. Now, on level ground, this would work just fine, but if the guy pulling the truck is pulling on a ground that's steep downhill, he better get the heck out of the way before that fire truck flattens him. These four guys on the right, if they're pushing that pickup truck straight uphill, and they don't push hard enough, well, they're going to find that truck coming back at them. Sucks for them. Equal and opposite equivalent forces are identified in these diagrams as P1 and P2. For equal and opposite equivalent forces, when you move them along the line of action, you still have no net force on the rigid body. In figure 3.4a, on the left, we have two tensile forces pulling on the rigid body. P1 and P2 are pulling it apart. And we could move P2 a little to the left. And if they're equal to each other, we'll have zero net force as shown in 3.4c. Likewise, we have two compressive forces acting on the rigid body in 3.4d in the lower left corner still called P2 and P1. And the equivalent force P2 prime still opposes P1. In figure 3.4e, P2 prime is moved along its line of action, so it's on the right side of this bar, but it's still opposing P1. And therefore, there is still zero net force on the bar. But in terms of the internal behavior of the bar, the two systems of forces shown are totally different. For Figures 3.4a and c, if you pull on the bar, while the bar may not move, it's still going to neck down so that it gets very skinny in the middle, as shown there on the right. And in figure 3.4d and f on the bottom, if you have two compressive forces pushing on a rigid body, the body may not move, 
but it's going to bulge out like a tin can, as you see shown here on the lower right. So the body will deform, but it won't move. And the reason it deforms is because of the internal forces that are in it. Let's go over vector products next. A vector product is also known as a cross product of two vectors. And the magnitude of a vector product V is equal to the magnitude of vector P times the magnitude of vector Q times the sine of the angle between the two vectors as shown on the bottom left in figure 3.5. A vector product yields a third vector and we determine the direction of that third vector from the right hand rule which you all struggled with in freshman physics. The idea is that when you put the fingers on your right hand and you curl them per the rotation of P going towards Q, your thumb, as long as it's your right hand that is, will point in the direction of V. And that's shown there on the lower right. Now, if you use your left hand to do this, you're gonna get exactly the opposite result of using your right hand. So make sure you use your right hand only to do this right hand rule. Now, as far as vector magnitudes go, if vector V is equal to P cross Q, then the magnitude V is the area of the parallelogram that has P and Q for sides, as shown here in figure 3.6. The vector product P cross Q is equal to P cross Q prime, if the line joining the tips of Q and Q prime is parallel to P. So here is our vector P and our vector Q. And here's vector Q prime. And notice Q prime ends along the line that is parallel to P and also contains the tip of Q. And here on the right, I've drawn you an area of the parallelogram for P cross Q prime. And this area of the parallelogram, which I'm drawing here with my mouse, is equal to the area of the parallelogram formed by P and Q. And therefore, they have the same area. And therefore, the vector product of P cross Q is equal to P cross Q prime. They'll have the same magnitude. And because we haven't moved the line of actions of P and Q prime relative to the original P and Q, vector V is gonna point up. Here's a quick concept application 3.1 for you, which shows you how we do the math for vector magnitude. Vector P lies in the XY plane at an angle of 30 degrees with the X axis. And P equals six. Vector Q lies along the x-axis, Q equals four. The angle between the two of them is 30 degrees, and therefore the magnitude of vector V is equal to P times Q times sine theta, which is six times four times sine of 30 degrees, sine of 30 degrees being a half, and we get 12. We find the direction of P cross Q using the right-hand rule, and that's vector V, and it's going to be pointed up because we grab onto P and we rotate it into Q and we find that our thumb points up, shows us the direction of V. Vector products are not commutative, which means that Q cross P does not equal to P cross Q. In fact, Q cross P is actually the negative of P cross Q which means that directions of the resulting vectors are opposite to each other, which you can again prove using the right-hand rule or you can take my word for it. Distributive properties do hold. P cross Q1 plus Q2 does equal to P cross Q plus P cross Q2, but the associative property does not hold in vector products. If you take P cross Q and then you cross it with vector S, you will not get P cross the cross product Q cross S. Let's go over vector products of unit vectors, which is an important tool that we're going to use later in this chapter 
when we solve more complex problems. The magnitude of the vector product of unit vectors equals one if the unit vectors are perpendicular to each other, and the magnitude equals zero if their unit vectors are parallel. For example, i cross i is zero, j cross j is zero, because those vectors are exactly the same vector. It wouldn't be any different if it was negative j cross j or negative i cross i. i cross j is equal to k, and j cross k is equal to i, k cross j equals negative i, meaning it still has a magnitude of one, it's just in the negative x direction. We can express the vector product v in terms of its rectangular components. v is equal to p cross q in all our examples, but p can be expressed as p sub xi plus p sub yj plus p sub zk, and q can be expressed as q sub xi plus q sub xj plus q sub z times k. v then becomes the sum of vector products where v is equal to pyqz minus p sub z q sub y times i plus p sub z q sub x minus p sub x q sub z times j plus p sub x q sub y minus p sub y q sub x times k. And if you can't memorize that formula and you can't even write it down correctly for an equation sheet for an exam, you can always remember it by using determinants, assuming you've learned that in other math classes. V can be calculated by setting up a determinant where i, j, and k are at the top, p, x, p, y, and p, z is the middle row, q, x, qy and qz are on the bottom row, and when you do your vector math, you're going to get the same equations that I just rattled off for the components v sub x, v sub y, and v sub z. Now let's discuss the definition of the moment of a force about a point. Force f acts on the rigid body in figure 3.10 here at point A. Vector r is the position vector of R, which joins point O, meaning the origin, with point A. And vectors R and F form a plane that cuts through this tan-colored blob that kind of looks like an egg, but is just meant to represent a generic rigid body. Moment M sub O, meaning the moment about the origin, is the cross product of R and f by definition. The magnitude m sub o equals the magnitude of r times the magnitude of f times sine of the angle theta between r and f. And that's shown right here in the diagram as angle theta. And then this angle on the other side of the vertex, of course, is also angle theta. And that magnitude m sub o is equal to f times d, where f is the magnitude of force f, and d is the perpendicular distance between point O and the line of action of force f. Sometimes we refer to d as the moment arm or lever arm of a force. Two forces f and f prime are equivalent if they have the same magnitude and direction and they have equal moments about a given point O. Here is force F acting at point A. There is force F prime acting on the same line of action as F, but set back so that it acts here where my mouse is as opposed to point A. These forces are equivalent because if you take the moment about point O, you're going to multiply either the magnitude of f times d, or you're going to multiply the magnitude of f prime times d, but because the magnitude of f and f prime are equal to each other, then the moment about point O of both forces is the same. You might be saying to yourself, give me a practical example of applying a moment. Well, you guys apply a moment every time you open a door. Here's a top view of a guy opening a door. 
where there's the hinge and there's a little spring mechanism that forces the door to shut back once you come through into the house. D is the distance from the line of the hinge to the door handle. Force F is applied straight on the door handle by pulling on it. The moment that you apply to open the door is your force F times your moment arm D, which is why they always put the door handle on the side of the door that is far away from the hinge, because if they put the door handle right next to the hinge, you would have to pull super hard on that door to get it open. So someone figured this out centuries ago and they didn't take vector mechanics. They probably just used their common sense and thought about it a little bit. And it didn't cost them $4,800 either to buy that door. Now let's discuss the direction of moments. Force F in figure 3.12 acts in the plane of this concrete slab. Kind of looks like more a potato, but in the book they call it a concrete slab. So I will too. And M sub O is the moment of F about point O, where the magnitude of M sub O is just equal to F times D. And in figure 3.12a, M sub O points out of the page because it is rotating the slab in a counterclockwise direction. And for moments, the counterclockwise direction is called a positive moment. M sub O points into the page in figure 3.12 because the direction of F would cause this concrete slab to rotate around point O in the clockwise direction. And this is defined as a negative moment. So in figure 3.12a, M sub O equals plus F times D. And in figure 3.12b, M sub O equals negative F times D. To illustrate clockwise rotation caused by a clockwise moment, I call upon Jesse and Woody. Suppose several forces are applied at the same point A, and we define R as the position vector of A relative to origin O. Varignon's theorem says that the resulting moment of all these forces relative to point O is equal to the sum of the moments of the various forces around point O. And in vector math, we would say R cross the quantity F1 plus F2 plus dot, 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 would equal to R cross F1 plus R cross F2 plus dot, 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 all the way up to the number of forces that are acting at point A. Now let's calculate 2D vector moments where R is relative to the origin. Force F lies in the XY plane, X at point A, which means that it has no component in the z direction. Vector r acts between point O and point A, and it has no component in the z direction, which means that the vector m sub O, which is equal to r cross f, is equal to xi plus yj crossed with fxi plus f sub yj, where x and y are the coordinates of point A, and F sub X and F sub Y are the components of force F. And a positive value for M sub O would mean that that vector M sub O points out of the page. A rigid body would then want to rotate counterclockwise. When we do our vector math, we find that M sub O is equal to component M sub Z times vector K, and M sub Z is equal to the X value times F sub Y, minus y times f sub x, that vector pointed in the z direction, and hence we use the symbol k. This is sample problem 3.1, in which we calculate a 2D vector moment where r is relative to the origin, shown as point O in the diagram. A 100 pound vertical force is applied to the end of this lever, 
which is attached at point O. And in this problem, we have five tasks. Task A will determine the moment of that 100 pound force about point O. Then we will determine the horizontal force applied at A that will create the same moment that we got around point O. Then we'll determine the smallest force that can be applied at point A that will create the same moment about point O. In question D, we're asked how far from the shaft would a 240 pound vertical force act to create the same moment about point O that we got in question A. And in question E, where I'll see what our audience thinks, we'll ask where any of the forces obtained in parts B, C, or D are equivalent to the original force that we got in part A. And first, we'll find the perpendicular distance D from O to the line of action of that 100 pound force. It's 24 inches from point A to point O. And the horizontal distance, which is our lever arm, denoted as D, is equal to 24 inches times the cosine of 60 degrees, which is a half, so D is equal to 12. The magnitude, then, of the moment around point O of our 100-pound force is the 100-pound force times D, which is 12 inches, and that moment, then, is 1,200-pound inches acting in the counterclockwise direction, hence positive. Now we'll find the perpendicular distance from point O to A that creates the same moment about point O. So now F is a variable, it's no longer 100 pounds, and it's acting horizontally. And it's equal to the distance D in this updated diagram, D is now a vertical distance, times the sine of 60 degrees, which is equal to 20.8 inches. Now we know the moment from the prior problem at 1,200 pound inches, and we know the lever arm D, and we can take M and divide by D to get the force F. That force is only 57.7 pounds, which is a lot less than the 100 pounds that we had before. Now we'll find the smallest force at point A that creates a 1,200 pound moment. The way you do this is you maximize the lever arm. And the way you do that is you set force F perpendicular to the axis of the lever, such that the distance D will now be 24 inches. Then we take our 1,200 pound moment and divide by 24, and we find that the smallest force possible is 50 pounds which is certainly less than 57.7 and less than 100. Now we reduce the distance along the shaft of where the force acts so that a 240 pound vertical force creates a 1200 pound inch moment. D now becomes the variable. The moment is still fixed at 1200 pounds and we divide by 240 pound force to get D at five inches, and then we figure out the length of line segment OB by taking D and dividing by the cosine of 60 degrees, and we find that line segment OB is equal to 10 inches. Now we'll determine if any of these forces from parts B, C, or D are equivalent to the original force in part A. Well, what do you think? By definition, two forces, F and F prime, are equivalent if and only if they have the same magnitude in the same direction and have equal moments about a given point O. So we're going to give our audience eh, five seconds to think about it. I never give the live class more than that. One, two, three, four, five. Time's up. Answer. Ding, 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 ding. None of them are equivalent. In problem 3.1a, we showed a 100-pound force pointed down. Well, in 3.1b, that force is horizontal. That's not the same line of action. And in 3.1c, the force is acting perpendicular to the axis of the lever. That's not the same line of action. And in 3.1d, our 240-pound force is vertical, but it's not acting along the same line of action anymore. 
it's moved from point A to point B. So that also violates one of the rules of having equivalent forces. So the answer is none of them. And if you got that right, you're going to do well in this course. Here's a quick Excel solution to the sample problem. Now let's discuss calculating 2D vector moments where vector r is not relative to the origin. In figure 3.1c, force f again acts in the xy plane. It has no z component and vector ra slash b, which means the vector to point a from point b, also has no z component. The vector r to a from b has components xa minus xb in i direction plus ya minus yb in the j direction, where these values are just the x and y values of points a and b. And that vector is crossed with fx times i plus fy times j, where fx and fy are the components of the force. M sub b, meaning the moment around point b, is again equal to a constant, which in this case is the magnitude of v times vector k, meaning it points in the positive z direction. And the magnitude equals x sub a minus x sub b times fy minus y sub a minus yb times f sub x. Here's sample problem 3.2 which shows how to calculate a 2D vector moment where vector r is not relative to the origin. A force of 800 newtons acts on the bracket shown in the diagram, and our job is to determine the moment of that force around point B using our equation at the bottom of the page that we just derived. We will resolve force F and position vector r a slash b into rectangular components and then we'll use our vector product to calculate the moment, which means we're going to use the equation on the bottom of the page to calculate the magnitude of vector m sub b. To resolve force f into rectangular components, note that force f acts at a 60 degree angle to the horizontal, which means that the x component is 800 newtons times cosine of 60 degrees, and the y component is 800 newtons times the sine of 60 degrees to get that f is equal to 400 newtons times i plus 693 newtons times j. Now neither points a or b are at the origin, but if you look at how I drew my coordinates x and y, I did not give absolute values to the coordinates at a and b, but we do have the relative values. B is to the right of A, which means it has a higher X value, and A is above point V, which means that the Y value of A is greater than the Y value of B, which means that X minus A is going to be a negative number because A is to the left of B. That's minus 200 millimeters, which is also shown in the diagram as minus 0.2 meters. And ya minus yb is going to be a positive number because the y value of a is certainly bigger than the y value of b. And in the diagram, it shows the difference is 0.16 meters, which is 160 millimeters. And therefore, using meters as our units of measure, r a slash b is equal to minus 0.2 meters times i plus 0.16 meters times j. In order to calculate the magnitude of m sub b, we take r of a slash b and cross it with f, which means we use our standard formula and plug in values. So m sub b is equal to xa minus xb, which is minus 0.2 times fy, which is 693, minus ya minus yb, which is 0.16 times f sub x is 400, and we do the math and we find that m sub b is minus 202.6 newton meters in the z direction, hence multiplies vector k. But in this case, m sub b is going in the clockwise direction because this vector will point along the negative z axis. Now we'll calculate 3D vector moments where r is relative to the origin. It's the same 
theory that we've been using, but we have to use our z values now of vectors. First, we resolve f into components fx, fy, and fz. So here's fz pointing out, f sub x to the right, fy going up. The components of position vector r, which is shown from the origin going to our point, are just the x and y and z coordinates of our point A. M around point O is still R crossed with F, but now R has three components and F has three components. The actual direction of M sub O will be per the coordinates you calculate that multiply i, j, and k, which are denoted as M sub x, M sub y, and M sub z. The vector m sub o is most easily calculated by taking a determinant with i, j, k on the top, x, y, z as the middle row, and f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z on the bottom row, which means you will get the vector m sub o with coordinates m sub x times i plus m sub y times j plus m sub z times k, shown here where my mouse is, where you derive m sub x, y, and z from these formulas. Now we'll show how to calculate 3D vector moments where r is not relative to the origin. Again, we have to resolve f into components f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z. The components of position vector r to point a from point b are x sub a slash b, which is equal to x a minus xb, y sub a slash b, which is equal to the y value of a minus the y value of b, and z sub a slash b, which is equal to the z value of point a minus the z value of point b. And moment m sub b is equal to r a slash b cross f. We will get vector m around point b with its three components mx, my, and mz. We calculate the values of mx, y, mz per the formulas shown here in the lower left, or you can set up a determinant where the top row is i, j, and k, the middle row is x, a, sub b, y, a, slash b, z, a, slash b, and the bottom row is fx, fy, and fz. Here is sample problem 3.4 for calculating 3D vector moments where R is not relative to the origin. A rectangular plate is supported by brackets at A and B and by the wire CD. The tension in wire CD is 200 newtons. Where my mouse is would represent some type of wall and these two little mounting brackets at point A and B are meant to keep the plate up against the wall. But because those mounting brackets are pretty puny and the plate would probably fall down if you put a plant on it or a book on it, we need this extra wire that connects C and D to keep the plate from falling down. Now we'll determine the moment about point A of the force exerted by the wire at point C. We'll use our unit vector lambda to determine F sub X, F Y, and F Z. We'll resolve the position vector r, c, slash, a into its rectangular components. Then we'll take the 3D vector product of those two vectors to calculate our vector representing the moment. In step one, we resolve the vector r, sub, c, slash, a into the components. And here is vector r, c, slash, a. It starts at a, points towards c. Just remember the nomenclature. It's vector r to point c from point a. That's why the c goes first and the a goes second. Neither points a or c are at the origin, but the diagram does show relative distances between the points. xc minus xa is equal to 0.3 meters. yc minus ya is zero because both points a and c are at y equals zero, which is the top of the plate. And zc minus z sub a is a little more complicated to calculate. We take 0.08 plus 0.24 plus 0.08. That's where c is in the z coordinate. A is 0.24 plus 0.08. And when we subtract those 
numbers from each other, we're left with 0.08, which means that vector r c slash a, which we can also denote by vector a c with this vector sign on top, that's alternative notation by the way, is equal to 0.3 meters times i plus 0.08 meters times k. Now we'll define our unit vector lambda and find its rectangular components. Note that unit vector lambda is oriented from point C to point D because lambda by definition always points in the same direction that the force does. Lambda in our vector notation is equal to vector CD. So here's C, D, a little vector sign on top, divided by the length of that vector, which is CD shown in italics. And per chapter two, we have to be very careful how we calculate dx, dy, and dz. dx is x2 minus x1, where point D is the one that has the x2, y2, and z2 coordinates, and point C is the one that has the x1, y1, and z1 coordinates. Therefore, d sub x is equal to x2 minus x1, which is equal to zero minus positive 0.3, that's equal to negative 0.3. dy is equal to y2 minus y1, which is equal to plus 0.24 minus zero, so that's plus 0.24. And d sub z is equal to z2 minus z1, which is equal to 0.08, where point d is, minus the sum of 0 0.08, 0 0.24, and 0 0.08 for the z value of point c. And that's equal to a negative 0.32 meters. d is then the square root of d sub x squared plus a d sub y squared plus d sub z squared, it also doubles as the length of vector CD, and that's equal to half a meter. Vector CD is equal to minus 0.3 meters times I plus 0.24 meters times J minus 0.32 meters times K with a length of 0.5 meters. Now we define vector F. Vector F has a magnitude of f, and it multiplies vector cd divided by its length. So we take our original vector, cd, and we multiply by 200 newtons for force f, and divide by 0.5 meters for the length of the line that connects c and d, and we get that force f is equal to minus 120 newtons times i plus 96 newtons times j minus 128 newtons times k. We form our three by three matrix to calculate the vector product m sub a, which is equal to f cross r c slash a. We take i, j, k on the top, xc minus xa and yc minus ya and zc minus za as the middle row. And at the bottom, we put our newly calculated vector fx, fy, and fz, which is minus 120, 96, and minus 128. I ground through the math here at the bottom of the page just to verify what our textbook has. So that m about point a of this 200 newton meter force is a vector that is minus 7.68 newton meters in i, plus 28.8 newton meters in J, plus 28.8 newton meters in K. I just drew a rough sketch of where M sub A would point in this diagram. I'm no Michelangelo, so it's not easy to draw vectors in 3D space for me. But you get a rough idea of where it points from the fact that it has a small negative component in the X direction, so it's got to point a little bit negative X and it has large components in positive directions for y and positive directions for k, meaning it's got to somehow point up along the y-axis and somehow point in the positive z direction. Here's an Excel solution to the problem showing in two pages how all the numbers were derived.
Now let's discuss scalar products. The scalar product of a two vectors p and q is by definition a scalar, hence the name scalar product. And the math formula to find the scalar product of vectors p and q is p dot q, there's our little dot symbol, p dot q is equal to magnitude of p times magnitude of q times cosine of theta, where theta is the angle in between vectors p and q. And because we use a little dot here as the symbol for a scalar product, sometimes scalar products are referred to as dot products. The commutative property does hold for scalar products, q dot p is equal to p dot q, and the distributive property holds too, which means that p dot q1 plus q2 is equal to p dot q1 plus p dot q2. And unlike vector products, where you will get a vector as your answer to the question, when you take a scalar product, it's just going to be a number. It won't have any vector components. We can express the scalar product of two vectors p and q in terms of their rectangular components in 3D space p has its components PXI plus PYJ plus PZ times K, and that is a dot for our symbol with vector QX times I plus QY times J plus QZ times K. But because of the properties of being associative, P dot Q is equal to P sub X Q sub X times I dot I which adds to PYQY times J dot J plus PZ times QZ times K dot K. But I dot I and J dot J and K dot K have a magnitude of one times one times cosine of zero degrees, which happens to be one, so that I dot I, J dot J, and K dot K are all one. And therefore P dot Q is equal to P sub X Q sub X plus p sub y q sub y plus p sub z q sub z. And note, if you take the scalar products of two vectors where they're not the same, you know, like i dot j, i dot k, minus i dot k, you're always going to get zero because it's then one times one times cosine 90 degrees and cosine 90 degrees is zero. The scalar product of two vectors p and q can be used to solve for the angle theta between the two vectors because p dot q is equal to p times q times cosine theta and that's equal to px qx plus py qy plus pz qz then you can do quick algebra and find out that cosine theta is equal to px qx plus py qy plus pz qz that whole quantity divided by the product of p times q. Let's discuss the projection of a vector on a given axis. Vector p forms an angle theta with line ol here in figure 3.19a. And the projection of vector p on the axis ol is a scalar where p sub ol is equal to p times cosine theta and P sub OL also happens to be the length of the line segment OA. You can calculate that from simple trigonometry of a right triangle too. P sub OL is positive if theta is an acute angle, it's a negative number if theta is an obtuse angle, and it's zero if theta is a right angle. We can also calculate the projection of vector p on unit vector lambda in figure 3.19c where lambda is located along the line ol. The components of lambda on the xyz axis are the direction cosines of ol per chapter 2 where lambda equals cosine theta sub x times i plus cosine theta sub y times j plus cosine theta sub z times k. P sub ol is p sub x cosine theta x times i dot i plus p sub y cosine theta sub y times j dot j plus p sub x cosine theta sub z times k dot k. 
but we've already shown that i dot i and j dot j and k dot k are one. So that P sub OL is cosine theta x plus PY cosine theta y plus P sub z times cosine theta sub z. Now we can use scalar products to calculate the moment of a force around an axis that passes through point O, the origin. Force F acts on a rigid body at point A and moment M sub O acts about point O but the moment m sub ol of f about line ol is the projection oc of moment mo onto axis ol. And because it's a projection, that means it's a scalar, which also means that the moment of a force about an axis, and this is going to be true whether that axis passes through the origin or not, but that moment is a scalar. Fundamental rule in chapter three is if you take the moment about a point, that will lead you to a vector solution. And if you take the moment about an axis, that leads to a scalar solution. Make sure not to mix those up. To find the moment m sub ol, we will need to calculate unit vector lambda along line ol and we'll need to calculate position vector r. Lambda is the unit vector along line OL, and m sub OL is lambda dot m sub O, which is the projection of vector m sub O onto line OL, and that equals to lambda dot r cross f. We can calculate m sub ol as the determinant where the top row is lambda x, lambda y, and lambda z, which are the direction cosines of axis ol. x, y, z is the second row. That's the coordinates of point A. Here's point A. And fx, fy, and fz are the components of force f. If you don't want to calculate the determinant, you can always use this formula that I put here on the last row to find m sub ol. Now let's calculate the moment of a force about an axis that does not pass through point O, which is the origin. In this case, lambda is a unit vector along line BL, shown here in figure 3.24, and m sub BL, which is the projection of the moment of force F around point B on axis OL is equal to lambda dot M sub B, which equals to lambda dot R A slash B crossed with vector F. Then M sub B L is the determinant of a matrix where you put X sub A B, which is equal to X A minus X B, y sub a b, which is equal to y sub a minus y sub b, and z sub a minus z sub b on the second row. And you put fx, fy, and fz on the bottom row, where those items are components of force f. And if you either don't know or don't want to go through the determinant calculation, you can use this complex formula, which I wrote out for you at the bottom of the slide. In this case, we will substitute either lambda equals i, j, or k in the equation m sub o l equals lambda dot vector m sub o. We let x, y, and z be the coordinates of point A. Vector r is equal to x times i plus y times j plus z times k fx, fy, and fz are the components of vector f, and r cross f is equal to m sub x times i plus m sub y times j plus m sub z times k, where those three scalars are calculated from the equation shown here where my mouse is. But for the moment about the x-axis, lambda is equal to i, and when we take lambda dot r cross f, that's equal to m sub x 
where we have an equation here for the moment about the x-axis m sub x. Similarly, we find that when we take the moment about the y-axis where lambda equals j, our scalar value is going to equal to scalar m sub y. And when we take the moment about the z-axis with lambda equals k, our scalar devolves to m sub z. Let's look at sample problem 3.5 for calculating a 3D vector moments about points and axes. The cube of side A in the figure below is acted upon by force F along the diagonal of the face. So here's force F on the face defined as FBCG. And our job is to determine the moment of P around point A, determine the moment of P about the edge of the cube AB, determine the moment of P about the diagonal AG, where that diagonal cuts through the middle of the cube, and using the results for the moment of P about the diagonal of the cube AG, we will then determine the perpendicular distance between this cube diagonal AG and the outside diagonal FC. We will first define the vector R to F from A. We'll use unit vector lambda to determine P sub X, P sub Y, and P sub Z. We'll calculate the unit vector lambda that points in the direction of axis AG. Here's AG. And then we'll use 3D vector and scalar products that we've learned to calculate the various moments. In step one, we make point O the origin of the coordinate system. And we define vector R F slash A, which means vector R to F from point A. We can do that because dx is equal to a, dy equals negative a, because the y value for f is 0, and the y value for point a equals to a, and dz equals 0, because our vector r f slash a cuts across the face of the cube, and therefore dz equals 0 and then our vector equals a times i minus a times j. We now define vector p, where lambda equals vector fc divided by the length of fc. dx is equal to 0 because f and c have the same x-coordinate. dy equals a because the y-value of point c is a and the y-value of point f is 0 and dz equals negative a because the z value of point c is 0 and the z value of point f is equal to a. Then vector fc is equal to aj minus ak and the length of fc is the square root of 0 squared plus a squared plus the quantity minus a squared and that just equals a times the square root of 2. Then lambda equals 1 over the square root of 2 times j minus 1 over the square root times k. Vector p is equal to magnitude p times lambda. To get force p, we take our vector lambda and multiply by magnitude p then force p is magnitude p over square root of 2 times j minus magnitude p divided by the square root of 2 times k. Now we can determine m sub a, which is the moment of force p about point a. m sub a is equal to vector r f slash a crossed with vector p. And when we do that math, we can create a determinant for vector m sub a. We put i, j, k on the top. We put the values a minus a and 0 on the second row, and the values 0, p divided by square root of 2, and minus p divided by the square root of 2 on the bottom row. 
and we take the determinant of that matrix and we find that vector m sub a is a times p divided by the square root of 2 times vector i plus vector j plus vector k. Now we can determine scalar value m sub a b, which is the moment of force p about the edge of the cube a b. m sub a b is also the projection of vector m sub a on edge a b. And it's also an example of the moment of a force about an axis that does not pass through the origin. So the unit vector that points in the direction of axis AB is simply lambda equal to I. And scalar M sub AB is then the scalar product of I and vector M sub A. So it's I dot AP over square root of 2 times I plus J plus K. But remember that I dot I is 1 and I dot J and I dot K is 0. So scalar value m sub a b is just equal to 1 times a times magnitude p divided by the square root of 2. Now we can determine m sub a g which is the moment of force p about axis a g. m sub a g is also the projection of vector m sub a on axis a g and it's also the moment of a force about an axis that does not pass through the origin. We start by calculating the unit vector lambda that points in the direction of axis AG. AG is equal to dx times i, and dx is a, which is the value of x at point G, minus 0, plus 0 minus a, which is dy, which is y value at point G is 0, minus y value at point A is a, plus dz times k, where dz is the z value of point g, which is 0, minus the z value at point a, which is equal to a. The length of axis a, g, then, is the square root of a squared plus a squared plus a squared, and that's just a times square root of 3. And we find that lambda, then, is 1 over the square root of 3, times i minus j minus k. Continuing onward, we take the scalar product of a vector m sub a and vector lambda. We write here from prior slides the value of lambda and vector m sub a, and we see that scalar quantity m sub a g is the scalar product of lambda and m sub a, and that's just equal to ap divided by square root of 2 times square root of 3, which is the square root of 6, and i dot i is 1, minus j dot j is minus 1, minus k dot k is another minus 1, 1 minus 1 minus 1 is minus 1, so scalar m sub a g is equal to minus a times p over square root of 6. We also have a more direct method to determine the moment of P about axis AG. You could have just formed a determinant where lambda X, lambda Y, and lambda Z formed the top row, X F sub A, Y F slash A, and Z F slash A formed the middle row, and F X, F Y, and F Z formed the bottom row. You would have gotten the determinant of the matrix that's shown here where my mouse is, and you still would have gotten m sub ag equal to minus ap divided by the square root of 6. Now we can solve for the perpendicular distance between axis ag and edge fc. Because p is perpendicular to vector ag, the scalar product of p and vector ag is 0. We can see that here by actually taking the scalar product, and we get minus ap over square root of 2 plus ap over square root of 2, which indeed equals 0. We can solve for d the perpendicular distance between ag and fc by noting two solutions for scalar value m sub ag. 
We saw before that scalar value of m sub a g from the prior slide is equal to minus a times p divided by the square root of 6. But we also know from basic vector mechanics that the moment of a force about an axis is just equal to the magnitude of the force times the perpendicular distance, which is p times d. Therefore, we set those quantities equal to each other, and we get that d equals a divided by the square root of 6. And the reason that m sub a g was minus p times d was that an observer whose eyeball is sitting right here at point g, who's watching the moment of p around axis a g, would see it as a clockwise moment. And therefore, that magnitude would have to be a negative sign. Hence, m sub a g would be interpreted as minus p times d.